Let's get into Job. Everybody knows Job's about suffering and the problem of evil. Why do bad things happen to good people? So pain gets our attention. C.S. Lewis wrote this little gem of a book, The Problem of Pain, where he says, Pain insists upon being attended to. God whispers to us in our pleasures, speaks in our consciences, but shouts in our pains. It is his megaphone to rouse a deaf world. So what do we do with this pain that seems to be indiscriminate? Well, you can come up with an Eastern solution where it's all about karma. This kind of moralistic approach to the thing uh, is a quick and easy solution to the thing. Of course, it has problems. Uh, if something bad happens to you, you got bad karma. So you must have done something bad to bring this bad karma on yourself. It's this simple moralistic explanation of the universe and of the problem of evil. Uh, that it's caused by some moral action that you committed. And you're like, Job here, what did I do to warrant this? You know, I mean, come on. All right, I've got some peccadillos. I mean, Job puts it right out there. Yeah, I'm not perfect, and he's pretty honest about it. He's got little faults and things, but there's a major disproportionate uh, retribution if, this is a, if, if the whole thing is just to be conceived moralistically doesn't seem fair that I lose my family, all my possessions, and have itching sores all over my body sitting on this dung heap, scraping them with a pot shard. Like, come on, I haven't done anything to warrant this. So I think he's kind of right in a certain sense. You know, there's a logic to what he's saying. Uh, so what does karma do with that problem? Well, they just push it into another life. So that's where you get the doctrine of reincarnation because it's like, all right, well, I must have done something in a past life, all right, because, uh, and that's the way out of the problem. Um, why bad things happen to good people? Maybe I did something in my past, li past life. I was um, a chainsaw murderer. I don't know, something, and uh, now these things are happening to me. But the Christian solution our Lord presents is, look, Sermon on the Mount, our Lord just says straight up. You know, we're to love our enemies. Why? Because he makes his sun rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on the just and the unjust. All right, so good things happen to bad people too. God's blessings. God blesses them in many respects. So there's a certain kind of impartiality about God's distribution of of good and bad in a certain sense, to some extent. Uh, so, yeah, we got to nuance that, and we're going to try to nuance that. Uh, but a very overly simplistic, moralistic explanation is explanation is not good enough. It's just too small. The moralistic, the moralistic notion of God is too small. And it leads into this prosperity gospel business, you know, we hear about, you know, that God invariably administers terrestrial punishment and reward for vice and virtue. If you stick to that in the strict sense, there's some problems that come as a result of that. And you know who really has a nice introduction to the book of Job is G.K. Chesterton. And I had, had no idea he wrote an introduction to the book of Job, but it's, I listened to it on Audible, and it was only like 30 minutes, 37 minutes, I think, so it's a really short introduction, but it's packed with all these Chestertonian insights, and I'm going to share a few of them with you, because it's really good stuff, you know, but before I get into Chesterton, though, I mean, you do see this moralistic, you can get a moralistic sense to explain why bad things happen to us if you read like something like the book of Deuteronomy you know there is a sense in which there's there is a retribution in salvation history in a certain sense God seems to use these pagan nations uh, to as a kind of like the rod on his children and he does that all throughout the book of Judges 
And the Assyrians, the Babylonians, you know, they're kind of administering God's punishment in a certain sense uh, on Israel. And it does seem like God's providentially allowing this to happen, and it has some remedial effect, and it seems to work. You know, it provides a remedy, uh, this seeming punishment. So you see this simplistic notion in the book of Deuteronomy a few times. And I'm not saying it's entirely, there's nothing good in this. Uh, there's something in this that is, uh, obviously it's part of the inspired word of God. Behold, I set before you this day a blessing and a curse. The blessing if you obey the commandments of the Lord your God, which I command you this day. And the curse if you do not obey the commandments of the Lord your God. The turn aside from the way which I command you this day. Uh, 11, let's look at chapter 30. And more of the same here. Uh, See, I have set before you this day life and good, death and evil. I call heaven and earth to witness against you this day. That I have set before you life and death, blessing and curse. Therefore choose life that you and your descendants may live. I guess you could um, interpret that in some moralistic sense, but I think it's more nuanced than that. The whole scripture has to be read together. Um, and uh, so we ought to counterbalance that with the Psalms and uh, the, our Lord's words in the gospel. We'll, we'll, we'll develop this, but... Certainly, I just want to put that out there that somebody, an immature and somebody with lacking real solid foundations in the faith might pick that up and tease out from the book of Deuteronomy or something uh, or elsewhere in the scriptures uh, an overly simplistic, moralistic solution to the problem of evil. There's a lot more in the Bible, the teaching of the church that will elucidate uh, and nuance this problem a little bit better for us. So if, if the Jews had answered that, that question wrongly, in other words, if they had uh, just simply reduced this to a moralistic explanation, the problem of evil, what a tragedy. Chesterton says if the Jews had answered that question wrongly, they might have lost all their after-influence in human history. Because we have a better solution. All we got to do is hold up the cross. If you want the ultimate solution to the problem of evil, you just stare at a crucifix long enough and it just unties the knot of frustration in the human soul when we look at that crucifix. Um, so if prosperity is the reward for virtue, Chesterton points out, it will be reduced to a mere symptom. So it's just symptomatic. You know, if you're uh, virtuous, you're going to prosper, period. So are all successful and prosperous men good? That's an interesting question. See, uh, excuse me, Chesterton brings up. He's like, okay, then we fall into this problem. We get really, it gets really fuzzy when we see that uh, wicked people, we know, they're not obeying God's commands, but they're prosperous and successful. So are they virtuous? Are they good? This is the problem. So the book of Job um, deals with this and addresses this problem in kind of a primitive fashion. It's not as developed as we find later, uh, but it intimates um, the New Covenant, the New Testament, uh, the rest of further development or maturing of our understanding of suffering and kind of intimate, but it is kind of in this very primitive state. It's a very ancient book, but it's incredibly interesting. But ultimately, it's pointing towards Christ. Job is a type of Christ. Christ coming into this world and suffering the way he did is the ultimate answer to the problem of suffering. But the book of Job saved the Jews from this overly moralistic, simplistic, reductionistic view about the problem of evil. That it's merely distribution, retribution of reward and punishment, and it's just kind of a tit for tat. If you do this, then this. 
simplistic thing. That's kind of the attitude that his questioners, his friends, are going to bring to Job. They're coming from that standpoint of this moralistic uh, worldview. Uh, and Job is really wrestling with the question. And uh, it puts its finger on it. So what is the purpose of God? It's kind of the deeper question in the book. I like that. I got that from Chesterton too. What is the purpose of God? You know, it's kind of a funny question. I've never heard it put that way. I mean, what's he doing? And is God worth it? Is following His commandments or seeking Him worth it? It's just a question. I'm not trying to answer it right now. I'm just putting it out there and let it bounce around in our brain. What is the purpose of God? Job is asking fundamental human questions. And it all comes back to God. That is the question. The great question for every single one of us, for the whole human race. The question of God's existence, is it worth it? Now, when we read the book of Psalms, you know, it puts the reality right out there that not only do good people suffer sometimes, but the evil people, wicked people, are prospering. And they're just outraged in the Psalms, you know, just just grabbing a few samples here but it's like psalm 73 is wrestling with this question i mean truly god is good to the upright to those who are pure in heart but as for me my feet had almost stumbled my steps had well nigh slipped for i was envious of the arrogant when i saw the prosperity of the wicked for they have no pangs their bodies are sound and sleek they're not in trouble as other men are. They are not stricken like other men. Therefore, pride is their necklace. Violence covers them as a garment. Their eyes swell out with fatness. Their hearts overflow with follies. They scoff and speak with malice. They set their mouths against the heavens and their tongues struts through the earth. Therefore, the people turn and praise them and find no fault in them. And they say, how can God know? Is there knowledge in the Most High? Behold, these are the wicked always at ease. They increase in riches. All in vain have I kept my heart clean and washed my hands in innocence. What an incredible statement. To say it's all vanity trying to follow God and live according to His ways. I love the Psalms are just so brutally honest. They just put it right out there. For all the day long, I've been stricken and chastened every morning. And if I had said, I will speak thus, I would have been untrue to the generation of thy children. Um, he's struggling. He doesn't know how to explain this or understand this. But then until he went into the sanctuary of God and perceived their end of the wicked. Truly thou dost set them in slippery places, thou dost make them fall to ruin. How, how they are destroyed in a moment, swept away utterly by terrors. They are like a dream when one awakes. On awaking, you despise their phantoms. Anyway, the bottom line, he's talking about death. That's how I interpret that. The final judgment is going to come in a minute. Uh, it could come any second. As Father Good used to say in his homilies, I never heard this, but I heard he said this all the time. You never know when a bullet's going to come flying through the window. Um, raise your hand if you remember him actually saying that. Anybody? Yeah, okay. Well, anyway, um, yep, it could be game over at any point. Our little pink body, our little tender body, so vulnerable, uh, any second. So, yeah, we're yucking it up on our yacht, but... Um, uh, when you look into the sanctuary of God and perceive their end, uh, it's really, really sad. And your heart breaks. And that's the way God feels. He's not sitting up there offended like, you know, 
looking at us down here. He feels terrible for us. He's, he knows that uh, we're not acting in accordance with what's truly good and fulfilling for us. Putting diesel fuel in an engine made for unleaded. He's the manufacturer who put that sticker on the door by the gas tank. All right, so he knows what's good for us. And when he sees us sin, he's not sitting there like, uh, you know, this disapproving, offended God. No, he feels terrible for us, compassion for us. And um, sees us doing damage to ourselves, hurting ourselves. Uh, that's the truth. Um, so let's look at another psalm and see that, uh, yes, bad things happen to good people. There's no way around it. Bad things are going to happen to everybody. The rain is going to fall on the just and the unjust. I mean, it's just there's no way around it. The Lord is near to the brokenhearted, though, and He saves the crushed in spirit. There's consolation in our suffering. That's something we have where if you don't have faith in God, I don't know, it's just suffering something to be avoided at all costs. It has no meaning. It has no purpose. That's even worse. At least for us, many are the afflictions of the righteous. Many are the afflictions of the righteous. But the Lord delivers him out of them all. Um, the spiritual comfort and consolation we have from our faith. The meaning and purpose it gives to our lives to bear our crosses, all privations and adversities in this life and difficulties that come down range, we can accept them. The comfort we receive uh, <clears throat> in our affliction, whereas imagine not having that. Um, you could see how somebody would just become jaded, cynical, and bitter. And uh, but for us, uh, we're trying to accept and embrace these things that are outside our control, knowing it's just temporary, provisional amount of suffering, a finite, provisional, temporary amount of suffering. It's not going to go on forever. So there's some things that we got to do to nuance this, okay? Yeah, Psalm 73 describes the wicked. They're so sleek and strong. In Hollywood or wherever, you know, these people look so good, these glamorous people, and everybody praises them to the high heavens and um, admires them. But Psalm 1, the very first psalm, describes the two ways. And there's real truth in that psalm that uh, there is a certain uh, blessing and curse. So Deuteronomy's right. That's why you can't read that passage in Deuteronomy or any passage like it in the Scriptures and say, see, it's just a blessing and a curse. Retribution and distribution. Curse and blessing. Good and evil. Uh, there is a sense in which when we act immorally, unrighteously, not in accordance with God and His ways, we pay the penalty. We suffer. So the wicked may look sleek and strong and everything, uh, but why do they kill themselves? Everybody wants to be a rock star. You're going to wind up in a bathtub like Jim Morrison, you know, all drugged up, uh, <clears throat> dead. It's like you would think... Running after all the things of the world will make you happy. Why is it that those who have all those things aren't happy? And consistently studies show the happiest people in America, according to uh, whatever that uh, polling is. What's that one that everybody knows? Uh, some poll. Some poll. Anyway, there's uh, been polls and studies done on who's the happiest, you know. Priests are way up there. We score extremely high. People who are givers who uh, make a gift of themselves are the happiest. Then those who um, us just try to get and receive and get all the things of this world, who, he who dies with the most toys wins. It's just it's miserable. Uh, it ends up being kind of, they're frustrated 
restless, irritable, and discontent. Uh, the ha happiest category of human beings in uh, America, according to one study that I heard, was African American, elderly African American women. Second to them was elderly Hispanic women. And third was elderly women in general. So if you're an elderly woman in here, you're very happy. <laughs> Not pointing any fingers anyway. But the, the probability is that you're happier than the rest of us. So, um, But anyway, uh, yeah, that just doesn't square with uh, the message we get from the world. Um, so Psalm 1 really describes these two ways and what is at the end of these two ways. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers. You know, he's going to be like a tree planted by streams of water that yields its fruit in its season. Its leaf does not wither, and all he does, he prospers. You know, that's not to be understood in some overly simplistic sense but there it's a better life we're still afflicted many afflictions we're going to have to deal with the righteous uh, but I'm telling you hands down uh, this is the better life acting in accordance with what is truly good and fulfilling for us that's the definition of happiness living according to God in his ways he's our manufacturer he made us the wicked are like chaff. They will not stand in the judgment. The Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. It leads to death. Um, so, yeah, it's not like a vending machine. Um, moralistic solution to this problem. It's more nuanced than that. Because uh, bad things happen to good people. So the God question and the cosmological philosophy, what's our philosophy of God? What's our philosophy, our worldview, our philosophy of the cosmos? I like how Chesterton talks about this. Suffering calls that into question. We get down to what is my bedrock footing inside myself? What am I planted on? What is my footing, my inner foothold, toehold, in this world, like what is we need a big picture. We need to come at this thing from a whole cosmological ph philosophy. The desire that means the desire to know what is, what is the case, what is the true state of affairs, what is real. We want an answer to that question. Job is an honest guy who's seeking the answer to that question. He's asking the fundamental human questions and he's honest. God loves that when we're like that and sincere. The key is we got to have good will, and Job has good will. He's sincerely seeking God and answers to his questions. He's not just mad and having a tantrum for the sake of having a tantrum like he's a big brat. No, it's much deeper than that in Job. That's why God rewards him at the end, and God speaks in such high praise of him at the end. Uh, because he recognizes, acknowledges, yeah, he's mad, he's outraged, uh, but his heart is broken, and he's longing for the good, and he has good will, a lot of good will. Um, now, I like Chester, and I just got to make one comment here, because people in our day, you know, talk about their private religion. Everybody's, you know, it's privatized. Religion is something private. And I love Chesterton here, so practical, so um, uh, such a man of great common sense. He's just like, look, man, you can't, what you're saying is, um, doesn't make any sense. You know, you can know, a man can no more possess a private religion than he can possess a private sun and moon. It's pretty brilliant. Because uh, basically, this is your assertion about what is the case in the grand equation of things. Like what's real? You know, so you're asserting what is truly the case to be what is the case. How can you privatize something like that that's so broad in its scope 
and this sweeping assertion about the meaning of things, the origin and end of all things, the purpose of our being and existence. You know, your cosmological philosophy is not something private. Uh, that's kind of absurd because you're making an objective truth claim. So I just like how he uh, attacks that notion because uh, let's just be honest about where we're coming from. Well, this is my private opinion, but, you know, um, you're making an assertion, okay, about what is truly the case. And I'm making an assertion. Don't. So let's ha have a dialogue here and try to discover this thing mutually together. Let's have a little, we're on a quest to try to discover what's truly real. Um, you short circuit the whole thing by just saying, oh, well, you have your private notion, I have my private notion. How are we gonna arrive at anything? This mutual quest uh, is kind of short circuited. Now, is Job an optimist or a pessimist? I like this little reflection in Chesterton. And he says, look, He's no pessimist. The reason why his heart is broken is because he's such an optimist. He's got a really high ideal about God, and he loves God. And he doesn't want to see God's reputation tarnished. Like, he wants an answer. He genuinely wants an answer from God to this dilemma that he's found himself in. And he's not going to go off like Josie Wales and start blasting everybody in case you never saw that movie. Uh, what's it called again? The Outlaw, the Outlaw Josie Wales. His wife and son are killed. His house burned, is burned down, and he's clunked over the head uh, by these Union soldiers. And then he digs his gun out from the burning wreckage of his house and goes on a rampage, okay? Um, <clears throat> now that's a, it's a good movie, but um, that's not what Job's doing here. Job is really wrestling with the question, uh, not just going on this tirade just to ventilate himself um, and rage against the world, against the machine. Uh, he wants to know. So he is an exasperated, perplexed, outraged, and insulted optimist. That's what Chesterton says. He wants an explanation. He demands an explanation from God. And he is fundamentally sincere. God loves that. He can deal with us when we're like that, okay? Um, so he's anxious to be convinced, Chesterton says. He believes deep down, or at least he wants to believe that God is good. There's meaning and purpose to everything and to his suffering. So God is asking Job who he is at the end, and that's so interesting because there's this kind of back and forth. And it, it's like Jacob wrestling with the man all night, okay? It's like that struggle, Israel, uh, is the one who struggles with God. You know, that struggle. Job is struggling. He's not even an Israelite. But he's struggling with God. He is one... Essentially, he's an Israelite in that sense. He's one who struggles with God, asking God, who are you? What's your purpose? Um, and the beauty is that at the end, God says, who are you? Those two questions in tension at the heart of this book um, and at the heart of the spiritual life, those two questions... You know, who are you, Lord, and who am I? And who are you, and who am I? You know, we look up to God for mercy, and then we look at ourselves, and we're disheartened by what we see. Uh, but we don't want to dwell too long on <laughs> ourselves. We look back up at God, and we look at ourselves, and we just go back and forth in the spiritual life. We don't want to despair. We don't want to be presumptuous on God's mercy either. Uh, so we're going back and forth, and I love this book because it's just that's really what it gets to is Job and God are locked in this struggle. So who God asks who Job is at the end, and after this long interrogation by Job, 
God answers with an exclamation. And this rhapsody of creation, kind of like marveling and wondering at all of the things he's created. So Job asks questions of God, and God answers with an exclamation point. Um, all these questions to Job, which humble him because he's not going to know the answers. Riddles. There's kind of riddles in God's answer, but, you know, isn't that... Don't we kind of want there to be a little mystery, you know? Chesterton says, riddles are more satisfying ultimately than answers that we come up with. So, yeah, it's frustrating to stay, to just tell me when I've suffered some grievous loss and my wife just died of cancer and, um, you know... And then just tell me to stare at a crucifix. And it's just like not very satisfying, you know, in a certain sense. Somebody might be frustrated by that. Like, yeah, we have to engage the struggle with the questions. And we just don't have this overly simplistic answer that mankind can come up with. Those aren't going to do it for us ultimately. Um, so the riddles are still better than over, overly simplistic man-made responses to these things. It's mysterious. God is optimistic, though, at the end, and I think that's a great point Chesterton makes, that uh, he describes the sons of God, which are the angels. The Catechism explains that. Uh, these are the angels in the very beginning of creation and how they're shouting for joy. Uh, God describes to Job, and it's like, okay, there must be something to shout for joy about. There must be something. There's optimism. There's hope there. You know, laced in this rhapsody of creation uh, that God launches into, there's rejoicing by the angels. They must be happy about something. Uh, some other little interesting things he teases out here. Snow and hail are kept up for trouble, for the day of battle and war. There's also this kind of intimation that there's going to be an Armageddon. There's going to be a final conquest of evil. I'm storing up ammunition for that day. And uh, there's going to be a final resolution to the problem of evil. That's pretty cool, too. I never read that in the book of Job. Chester and again. So... Um, we're going to just run through who Job is, and then we're going to take a break. Uh, so let's just talk now, kind of introduce the themes of the thing in broad strokes. Let's talk about Job specifically. Who is he? He is a Gentile. People will shock, might be shocked to hear that, but he's just a righteous Gentile. Okay? Most likely from Eden. Edom. E-D-O-M. Not Eden, Edom. Edom is east of Israel, and it's known for its wisdom. Okay, these wise men coming from the east, you know, it's kind of interesting. So this eastern uh, wisdom tradition uh, is mentioned in the prophets like Jeremiah 49, 7. And Job, therefore, being a Gentile, is... Uh, kind of representative of um, the whole world. There's something kind of um, primordial about this, almost Adamic, as in Adam and Eve. You know, it goes back to the garden. It's like, hey, we're in solidarity, the whole human race. We're ultimately one family. This guy's just like the rest of us. Today's gospel, the Santorian, our Lord praised. So, you know, people from the east, west, north, south are going to be sitting at this banquet in the kingdom of God with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Some of you is, some of y'all are going to be sitting outside. All right, he was so impressed with the faith of the centurion. So that universality or kata holocaust view of salvation history, according to the whole kata holocaust, it's always been God's plan. So I love the fact that Job is absolutely not an Israelite at all, and there's no reference to anything Jewish. Zip. Zero. Yeah. Back in Abraham's time or even before 
some people might think, well, this was written uh, after the exile or something, but that's kind of a hard case to make because it's like there's no reference to anything Jewish, no reference to any of their struggles, things that people would identify with. So if you're writing for this Jewish audience after the exile or something like that, and that's when this book was written, why would you do that? Why is there no mention of a Levitical priesthood, temple worship? I mean, it goes back to like this, he's like a tribal chieftain, chieftain, like Abraham or something. He's a very rich man, the greatest man in the land. He's got X number of <laughs> animals and land and property, and he's got these seven sons and three daughters. I mean, he's like very wealthy and prosperous, the greatest man in the region um, of these wise people of the East. Uh, but all his friends are all Gentiles that come and talk to him. So there's kind of a universality and transcendence about this book um, that I really, really like. And he's mentioned in the book of Ezekiel, and James mentions him okay, in his letter in the New Testament. But Ezekiel in chapter 14 mentions him alongside Noah and Daniel. He mentions Job. That's just kind of cool. He gets a mention by one of the prophets. So, and Ezekiel is writing or lived uh, during the exile, uh, the Babylonian exile. So, and he's mentioning this guy like he already exists. Uh, it's just kind of like pre-Jewish is the best explanation that Scripture scholars, I think, can argue. Some of them come up with other arguments, you know, that it was later. But I'm telling you, the earlier dating of this book, that's why many of them think this is the earliest book in the, New Test in the Old Testament. This is the oldest book in the Old Testament, the book of Job. And there's some solid reasons for believing that. So it's kind of a, is he a historical character? You know, he could have been. He very well could have been. Um, now, is it kind of like a doctored up story? Yeah, I like Chesterton's point. So was, I don't know, Hamlet or whatever, King Lear or something, you know. I mean, Shakespeare wrote about these guys and made up all these stories. There's real historical figures underneath some of them. Um, and Julius Caesar and Anthony and Cleopatra. Uh, so is it fictional? Yeah, but it's kind of historical fiction. Uh and it could have a historical basis. There could have been a guy who suffered this stuff. Who knows? Um, now, it's kind of the Shakespearean work of the Old Testament, according to Chesterton. And I like that expression. Now, uh, it is an important transitional book because it leads us out of all that, you know, the Deuteronomic history, the chronological chrono chronicle or chronicle history or whatever you call that we've been in for a while now and it's like it segues into the wisdom literature and the psalms so it's like smack in there in our canon um and it's kind of a nice segue because it's older than the psalms it's older than all the other wisdom literature so it's the first in that sequence and then you kind of have david Represented by the book of Psalms, the genius, the interior life of David there, and then the Solomonic uh, wisdom. So there's kind of a chronology of the way the wisdom literature is organized. Job comes first. Um, he has a long life like the patriarchs. I think he's like 140 or something like that at the end. No contextual references to the struggles of Judah or Israel. And why, this is an interesting point, why would the author, if this is a Jew writing this thing at a later date, why in the world would they use a man from Edom, a traditional enemy of Israel, uh, if this was some sort of post-exilic writing, why? Now, there's also um, the fact that there's other ancient Near Eastern texts on suffering, okay, that were floating around by the Egyptians and the Babylonians and the Akkadians and the Sumerians. Um, 
So there's precedent already for ancient books addressing this problem of suffering. I think Job fits into that genre. I think it's one other book uh, with the exception or with the... Um, uh, but for the simple fact that it's inspired and it's part of the canon and the inspired Word of God. So uh, I think... I will stop there. We'll take a little break.